Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Chicago at the People's Summit. Now we're going to talk about an issue which actually isn't getting a lot of talk at the People's Summit, and that's U.S. foreign policy. Joining us to discuss all of this is Phyllis Bennis. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you, Paul. So Phyllis is a fellow and director of the New Internationalism Project at the Institute for Policy Studies in D.C. She's the author of many books, including her most recent book, Understanding ISIS and the New Global War on Terror. So this whole conference is framed around continue the political revolution. Uh, there's actually very little to almost no talk about actually voting for Hillary Clinton. Uh, there is some talk certainly about defeating Donald Trump, uh, but mostly it's about keeping this movement going. There's a lot of discussion about down ticket fights, both for Congress and electing progressives in all kinds of different governmental bodies and people getting involved in that, which has really been the main sort of action call. But in talk of the political revolution, very little about U.S. foreign policy. Tulsi Gabbard gave a plenary talk where she did talk about uh, sort of attack U.S. interventionism and such. It was a strong speech, but about the only really strong plenary, I, mean, I think the only plenary speech on foreign policy, you were on a panel uh, to do with foreign policy. But what, what do you make of all this? I think it would be a mistake to say that the agenda of this conference is somehow either reflective of or determinative of the, the prospects of the next period of building this movement around what we're calling the political revolution. Uh, the movement that came out of the Bernie Sanders campaign that wasn't ever only about Bernie Sanders but was always about something more than that, but where that consolidated and energized uh, a lot of people who hadn't been involved in organized campaigns before. And for most of those people, the original organizing point that drew them in were the movements that are, in fact, on the rise right now in a way that the anti-war movements are not. So the Black Lives Matter movement, the Dreamers, the Immigrant Rights Movement, the GLBT movement, the Environmental Justice Movement, all of these movements have had much more immediacy in, in the last couple of years. The peace movement, unfortunately, has gone through a rough patch. I, I don't think there's any two ways about it. The peace movement hasn't been as much of a presence as it should be in those broader movements. I think we, we make a mistake when we say, well, why aren't they coming to us? You know, they and us. It's not about them and us. All of our movements are stronger when we are linked together. If we look back at the, in, the, in the history of this country, in the, in just in, say, the recent past, in the last 50 or 60 years, the strongest movements, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement around Vietnam, the leaders, the great leaders that were created by those movements, you know, because people create movements, but movements also create people. Leaders aren't just born, they're created by movements. And the best of our leaders, the pantheon of leaders, people like Dr. King, people like Malcolm X, people like Muhammad Ali, the cultural workers like Harry Belafonte or, or uh, Joan Baez or, or uh, people like Howard Zinn, they worked in both the anti-war movements and the civil rights movements. They were both against war and against racism. So that's the lesson that I think for those of us in the anti-war movement is so critical. What we're seeing here is that the presence of a strong anti-war, anti-intervention, diplomacy over war presence isn't here in the, in the organizing of the, of the conference. I wonder if one of the reasons is, is that there's uh, a little lack of enthusiasm amongst a lot of people for some of the foreign policy positions that Bernie Sanders has taken. And they don't want to open up a kind of big argument here about his foreign policy. Cause it's possible. I, you know, I think there was a, a large problem in the Bernie Sanders campaign that reflected a lack of attention to foreign policy. The positions that Bernie Sanders did take, I think, were mostly very good. Some of them were extraordinarily good. His position on Israel-Palestine, for instance, his decision right away to skip the speech of Netanyahu months ago and to follow that up by refusing to go to the AIPAC convention. That was huge. He gave an amazing speech the next day where he said, yes, we need to uh, recognize Israel, but he left out the demand that Netanyahu has made where he, the, the demand is, we must recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Now, unfortunately, the next day, in an interview with the, the New York Post, Bernie Sanders changed his position. And when they asked him, did you just forget to mention the words as a Jewish state? And he said, yeah, of course that's what I meant, which was like, no, that isn't what you really meant. You know, there's been some other issues. 
he's taken a very strong position against Hillary Clinton's call for a no-fly zone in Syria. That's been very important. But he hasn't used all of the, uh, the, the evidence of why that policy would be so wrong. You know, Hillary Clinton, when she was urging that policy around, uh, around Libya back in 2011, the then Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, said very explicitly, let's be clear, a no-fly zone starts with going to war. So I was hoping that Bernie Sanders or others would say to Hillary Clinton, so are you saying that Robert Gates was wrong when he said that the first thing you have to do is go to war to take out the anti-aircraft system? Or are you saying you're prepared to go to war against Russia? You know, nobody really challenged her on that. So there might be some, some issues about Bernie Sanders' foreign policy being insufficient. But I don't think there were things that he said that in general people would be disagreeing with. I think it's more that at this moment in time, the leading forces of our broad movements are not primarily the anti-war movements. That's not true globally. I mean, if we look, for example, at the Arab Spring, some of the organizers of the, uh, the Tahrir Square protests in Cairo were very clear that they first came together on the February 15, 2003 mobilizations when they said, as one of them memorably said, we were looking around the world and we saw all these white, whiskey-swilling infidels challenging war in our neighborhood. And we thought, we have to do something. And we tried, but we didn't do very well. And we said, we have to do better. And frankly, they did way better. Eight years later, they overthrew a dictator based on that experience. So I think that the notion that the wars against the wars, the anti-war movement was somehow not part of this process of standing on the shoulders of those who go before, that's really not the case. Now, people may forget about it sometimes because right now, the anti-war movement is not the cutting edge, the leading force of the progressive movement. We can't pretend that it is. But I think we do need to recognize that what the U.S. government stands for, what U.S. corporations profit from, have everything to do with war. And we leave that out at our peril. Uh, Tulsi Gubbard's been on the campaign trail for Sanders all over the country. She seems to almost emerge as the foreign policy spokesperson of the campaign because it's essentially she only talks about foreign policy with the exception of this fight for to reform the Democratic Party. She's got a petition now to get rid of superdelegates at the convention. Um, but they've kind of let her play that role. Um, what do you make of her positions on things? Well, I think her positions on the wars are very good. She's against intervention. She recognizes that this is not helping people in those countries or here. It doesn't make any of us safer. So that's all fine. I don't think having one person who's a sitting member of Congress uh, be the spokesperson for the progressive movement on foreign policy makes any sense at all. She's very progressive. She's still a member of Congress, and that means there are limits to how far she can go. I don't know that she's said a word, for example, about Israel-Palestine. Would she support cutting back on the $3.1 billion a year in military aid that the U.S. gives to Israel? I haven't heard that from her. Where does she stand on, uh, on questions of, of new, the manufacture of new weapons for the Pentagon, some of which the Pentagon itself doesn't even want? But does she want to cut back on the F-35 bomber? Does she want to cut back on uh, the, the trillion dollar budget that President Obama is talking about to make new versions of our nuclear weapons? This, these are much broader issues that our movement needs to be engaged with. Working with Congress is one important aspect of that, but it is by far not the same thing. We are not about elections. We are about building movements. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.